Uh, well, good afternoon um, and welcome to this webinar um, in part of our series on financial centers of the world, um, focusing today uh, on Guernsey uh, with Robert with Rupert Pleasant, Chief Executive Officer of Guernsey Finance. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just a brief word uh, to introduce myself. If you haven't met me already on these um, calls or in person, I'm Mike Wardle, Director and Head of Indices uh, with CN Group, and I shall be uh, moderating the session this afternoon. Um, I need to say a few thank yous before we get started. Uh, first of all, um, I have to say thank you to the sponsors for the FS Club, um, who allow us to range uh, widely uh, and across the fields of finance and technology. Um, and without their support, we wouldn't be able to uh, run the range of events that we have been able to over the last year and a half. Um, a brief word on the programme today. Um, my role here is really to get out of the way as soon as possible um, and give over the time to Rupert to uh, give the keynote presentation. Um, I'll make a few comments about how we see Guernsey as a financial centre from the perspective of a, uh, the research we do into financial centres, and then there will be a Q&A session towards the end. Um, for those of you who have used this uh, go-to webinar platform before, you'll be aware of how to put a question into the um, panel. Um, it, there's a question uh, box on your dashboard on screen, and just type in your question, and that will come to us, and we'll moderate that and field that at the end. Um, and it, it, we will pass on contact details for anyone who um, drops a question into the question box to Rupert, um, so you can continue the conversation if you need to uh, after the webinar event. So it's just a, for me to, um, with you know, much gratitude to Rupert, to uh, welcome him to the webinar. Um, as I say, Chief Executive Officer of Guernsey Finance uh, joins us today uh, from the Channel Islands, where Guernsey has had, um, as far as I can see, a good pandemic. And I saw Rupert will speak a bit more about um, the current state of affairs in Guernsey. Um, but Rupert, um, welcome. We're really looking forward to your presentation. Uh, and the floor is yours. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed, Mike. I'm not quite sure there's anything uh, as, as uh, you know, a good pandemic, but as good as it can be, we've certainly had it over here anyway. Um, anyway, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for joining this session, uh, Guernsey, our place in the world. My name is Rupert Pleasant, and I'm the chief executive of Guernsey Finance, which is the promotional agency for the financial services industry of Guernsey. So in this next 20 minutes, half an hour, I'll go through a number of topics which are going to include Guernsey's political and economic stability and its capacity as a crown dependency of the UK. The island is a leading centre of economic substance. Guernsey is a conduit for global investment, bridging global capital flows between the world's major economies. Our various and looking innovation through financial services offerings and the island's leadership in the development of green and sustainable finance. As Mike mentioned, um, we'll be taking uh, Q&A at the end, um, just to let you know if there's uh, any questions that uh, we can't answer during this session, then um, please do leave details and uh, we will make sure that we do address that question and get back to you. Um, and by the way, just before I start, you're going to see um, lots of nice pictures of Guernsey all the way through. Um, for those who haven't been to the island, I would highly recommend coming over as a great post-pandemic getaway. Um, so um, let's look at Guernsey and our place in the world. As many of you will hopefully appreciate, Guernsey is not in the United Kingdom, but we are a crown dependency. Our relationship with the UK is through the Crown and so is not political. We're part of the British Isles, but outside of the UK. This means, and, and you know, the case has been unchanged um, for many, many years. Um, and even after the UK's departure from the EU, uh, our uh, status remains unchanged. The island has over 800 years of constitutional autonomy, with the UK responsible only for civil aviation and defence. After Brexit, as I mentioned, our third party relationship, uh, both with the UK and the European Union, also remains unchanged. Crucially, this includes unchanged access for financial services. In essence, we have a close working relationship with the UK and are something of a partner to the nation, particularly to the City of London, but remain firmly outside the UK and also the EU. This has meant and continues to mean that Guernsey is shielded from, pol from political, legal, and fiscal volatility on either side of the channel. In addition to a strong relationship with the UK and the EU, 
The island's place in the world is one of alignment with international standards and multinational institutions. World Trade Organization membership extends to Guernsey through our relationship with the UK as a Crown dependency. As a result, many of the free trade deals the UK has signed with some of the world's major economies also extend to the island. Guernsey has also had a close working relationship with the OECD, the Organization for Economic and Commercial Development, for more than 30 years, with the OEC Convention having applied to Guernsey since 1990. The island is truly proud to play its part in the successful fight against genuine tax evasion. The government of Guernsey was an early adopter of the OECD's common reporting standards. So I guess in a small nutshell, that's our place in the world. But what about our role in the world? Firstly, Guernsey is a major facilitator of British, European and United States investment. Last year, Guernsey's government commissioned research to break down the island's fund flows. According to the research in mid uh, 2019, Guernsey domicile funds enabled a total global flow of almost 120 billion pounds. In mid 2019 alone, Guernsey domicile funds enabled a capital flow of 41 billion pounds into the UK and 77 billion pounds into Europe. In addition, the research conducted by Frontier Economics suggests that Guernsey domicile funds enabled a capital flow of over 43 billion pounds into the US mid 2019. I should note that the island's role in the world is not just one of facilitating major investment, but also into causes that generate a genuine and tangible social return. This particular research found that the capital funnels into the continent was responsible for providing tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people in both the UK and Europe with jobs. As just mentioned, Guernsey is not just a facilitator of global investment, but it's also an efficient one. Guernsey, like many other global finance centers, has the ability to funnel capital efficiently Something often forgotten is that this capital is often channeled into very worthy causes. While I'll go into this in greater detail a bit later on, much philanthropy and charitable activity, as well as impact and ESG funds, benefit from this economic efficiency. So where does Guernsey sit following Brexit and its associated developments in regard to market access? Well, as you might expect, this is a very good message. Guernsey has unchanged access to the UK following Brexit. It is presently home to more non-UK entities listed on the London Stock Exchange than any other international jurisdiction. We also retain our access to the European Union. We're a specialist leader in the European private equities market. And finally, our access to the United States also remains unchanged. The island has the highest number of funds sold in the US through Regulation D, Private Placement Rules, which is the Securities and Exchange Commission regulation governing private placement exceptions, allowing capital to be raised without registration with the SEC. And by the way, just in case there are any doubt, those are not pictures of Guernsey, by the way. So moving on. So it probably won't surprise you that substance is going to form a very large part of this webinar. The world is more and more looking for both economic and physical substance in the jurisdictions that people are using. This is the case with all regulators and supervisors, including the likes of the OECD, as we've touched on already, but also FATF and many others. As a result of this, the substance of some jurisdictions is now coming into question. Guernsey, on the other hand, scores very highly on economic substance by all measures and as such has benefited handsomely with an inflow of business from many of our competitive jurisdictions over the past 12 to 18 months. So let's look at Guernsey's credentials in more detail. Firstly, Guernsey is whitelisted on both the OECD and EU lists for proven economic substance. The island was whitelisted by the OECD more than 10 years ago in 2009 and was whitelisted by the EU in 2019. In addition, Guernsey introduced economic substance legislation by an amendment to the income tax regulations, also in 2019. 
This is also an area that could be expanded upon as Guernsey continues to meet its international obligations and expectations and align with ever-changing standards. So now looking at taxation matters. Guernsey is fully committed to all the treaties and taxation measures put forward by the OECD and the Financial Action Task Force, commonly referred to as FATF. The issue of base erosion and profit sharing, or BEPS, is becoming an increasing focus of governments worldwide and will no doubt continue with more vigour as the world moves beyond the COVID pandemic. Guernsey is an active participant in these initiatives and in addition is considered, is considered compliant or largely compliant with 48 out of 49 of the Financial Action Task Force recommendations on anti-money laundering and combating the financing of terrorism. It would also be remiss of us not to mention Guernsey's place in the world with regard to recent global developments in this space. Following the annual meeting of the G7 in the UK in the last, uh, well, actually last month, and a subsequent meeting of the group's seven finance ministers in the lead up to the summit itself, the group agreed to endorse a global minimum corporate tax rate of 15%. Since then, most of the countries of the world have confirmed that they back an OECD plan to set a global minimum corporate tax rate of 15%. Guernsey was part of this discussion and agrees that this is an attempt to address the challenges presented by an ever-changing globalized world with an increasingly digital focused world economy in which profits can be shifted across borders. Guernsey's government has confirmed it will respond in policy terms as and when more formal discussions begin to be made and expressly supports the uh, object objective of reaching an agreement on a worldwide approach in levelling the play playing field, which will help avoid the complexities of a unilateral action by many different countries. And a final slide on this section. In regards to tax transparency, Global was an, uh, Guernsey was an early adopter in 2014 of the OECD Common Reporting Standards on the Automatic Exchange of Information. In addition, Guernsey signed a Model 1 agreement with the United States to implement FATCA-based reporting in 2013. As previously mentioned, the island was whitelisted in 2009 by the OECD, but it was formally branded a cooperative jurisdiction in 2015. So Guernsey remains keen to build on this great working relationship. So that's our place and role in the world. So let's take a look at our key competencies and areas of significant expertise. As a leading global finance centre, Guernsey has a reputation as a result of more than 50 years experience in the servicing and administering of various private wealth structures, investment funds, pension vehicles, as well as various forms of banking and insurance services. It goes without saying that Guernsey is a global leader in the international finance sector. We are a global fund leader with a number one in the European private equities market. We're a leader in the captive insurance sector. We provide alternative risk transfer solutions to very sophisticated clients. Guernsey has over 50 years experience in the servicing of the private wealth industry, leading to speciality in the operations of family offices. With over 5,000 family offices worldwide, this is a growing and vibrant sector and is expected that the growth and the evolution of a number of markets, including the Middle East and the Greater Bay Area, will accelerate this trend. We also have a strong speciality in, in uh, international retirement schemes for internationally mobile employees with locally based legal, actuarial and tax advisors well versed in this area. So turning now to one of the most important developments in the financial services industry for many years um, and one that is attracting a great deal of focus all over the world. That is the subject of green and sustainable finance and ESG, the inclusion of environmental, social and government factors. This is a key area of focus for us in Guernsey. We're very proud of our commitments to sustainability, and this can be well evidenced by the following initiatives and areas of international engagement. We're a founding member of the United Nations International Network of Financial Centres for, Sust uh, for Sustainability in Europe, also known as UNFC4S. We're also a member of uh, several other UN initiatives, including the Sustainable Insurance Forum, the Sustainable Stock Exchanges, and created in 2017, 
the network of central banks and supervisors for greening the financial system, um, or somewhat uh, uh, convoluted NGFS. In terms of what is unique to Guernsey, the island operates the world's first green fund regime, and there are now many examples and case studies of funds that have been established on the island which meet the criteria to be awarded the Guernsey Green Kite Mark. If you wish to find out more about this, you can find materials by either looking on our website, which is weareguernsey.com, or that of the Guernsey Financial Services Commission, which is gfsc.gg. We are home to the International Stock Exchange, uh, commonly known as TIES. The stock exchange operates its own sustainable segment, highlighting those investments and utilities, including bonds, funds, and companies, which enhance or protect the environment. Also, the Guernsey International Insurance Association have developed the world's first ESG framework for ins insurance-linked securities and captive insurance. This launched earlier this year and is truly a world first. All in all, we believe that Guernsey's leadership in the space of green and sustainable finance cannot be disputed. The island's reputation in this field is increasingly becoming a key reason as to why business activities are either being launched from or being relocated to Guernsey. So now let's take a look at three other pillars of the Guernsey financial services industry. These are private wealth, investment funds, and insurance. So let's take a look at each in a little more detail. When we start to talk about private wealth, we should start with the overarching subject of the family office. Guernsey has a long tradition of providing specialist private wealth management services to sophisticated private clients and their families. The secure environment, both economically and politically, is an ideal safe haven for private clients. The breadth and depth of experienced professionals operating on the island, including fiduciary services, investment management, tax services, and legal advisors, makes Guernsey a center of true economic substance. We're fortunate to enjoy a regulator who is responsible yet flexible, with a culture promoting honesty, competence, and financial soundness. So let's take a quick look at trust, which are almost always at the heart of a well-structured family office. Guernsey has a very well-known, robust, and recognized trust legislation, and is a great jurisdiction for the vehicle. It operates modern trust legislation overseen by an effective and impartial judiciary. Indeed, Guernsey has previously been commented on in the UK courts for the strength and diligence of its trust regime, drawing praise for its effective trusteeship and strong, well-prepared trust structures. There are many long-established and well-respected practitioners on the island, making it an ideal location for establishing a trust. In addition, if the beneficiaries are non-Guernsey residents, they enjoy tax neutrality. Of course, establishing companies is also a key part of some financial plans. Guernsey's company legislation is modern and efficient. It enables swift setup of company structures, and naturally, the island's financial services sector has all the necessary expertise, experience, and substance to ensure efficient administration. Guernsey also provides a high degree of innovation and is home to the first ever protected cell company structure. Guernsey enjoys access to various types of private wealth solutions. Depending on the individual situation, clients and their advisors can choose from private trust companies. This is an incorporated company which is formed specifically to act as a trustee of a single trust or a group of trusts for a family. A private trust foundation. This is a foundation established for the same purpose as a private trust, although I'll look at foundations a little more later. A purpose trust. This is a trust established for a specific purpose, for example, to hold shares in a family owned trading company. Guernsey can also offer various other different private wealth solutions, including employee benefit trusts, potentially housing pension funds and other employee benefits, successor trustee arrangements which are becoming more and more accepted as necessary, given the changing circumstances in some other more unstable jurisdictions. 
And of course, as the previously mentioned Guernsey Foundation, this differs from a trust in several ways, including having a separate legal personality with no separation of legal and beneficial title with the assets belonging to the foundation. It's also possible to migrate a foundation to Guernsey where permitted by the third party jurisdiction, and we have indeed seen this happen. Moving on, Guernsey is a global leader in investment funds with over $400 billion of assets under management administered in the island. And it also boasts the highest number of London Stock Exchange listing of any non-UK jurisdiction. The regulatory environment for the administration of funds in Guernsey is simple, agile and flexible. As was outlined earlier, Guernsey is a leading centre of substance, whitelisted by both the OECD and the EU, but crucially has proven an unchanged market access into the UK, the EU and the US. Continuing on the theme of investment funds, Guernsey offers structures for both open-ended and closed structures. Guernsey Green Fund is the world's first recognized green fund solution. Sophisticated investors may take advantage of private investment funds or PIFs with streamlined regulation based on a declaration made to the Guernsey Financial Services Commission by the fund manager. In fact, a recent revision to the PIF regime enables a PIF to be created as a bespoke private wealth structure where there is a family relationship between the investors. Private fund structures are also available, uh, providing a, a pooled organized vehicle for assisting uh, planning in family offices. Finally, on fund solutions, Guernsey makes it simple, quick and efficient to migrate both collective investment schemes and limited partnerships to the island. The process combines consent to migrate and licensing, making it an excellent solution for collective investment schemes looking to migrate. And all this can typically done within a 10 day period. Lastly, but by mo uh, no means least, uh, we can turn to insurance. Guernsey is home to a specialist insurance sector, providing alternative risk transfer solutions to very sophisticated clients. The insurance sector is pioneering and is full of innovation, boasting a strong leadership position in the global market. The insurance industry on the island is overseen by a flexible and responsive regulator and is endorsed in all aspects of international regulation by the International Association of Insurance Supervisors. Other key strengths of Guernsey's insurance industry include being Europe's global leading captive insurance domicile, close geographic proximity to London and other European centres, operating a risk-based solvency approach which adheres to international standards whilst being outside of solvency too. The industry's regulatory regime is rated as complying with global standards by the International Monetary Fund and the International Association of Insurance Supervisors during their recent inspection in 2019 and operating with a commitment to sustainable finance. Guernsey's International Insurance Association is a signatory to the uh, United Nations Su Sustainable Insurance Forum. So that brings me to the end of this short trip around Guernsey's credentials on the world's financial stage. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that have come in during the uh, presentation. Please do not hesitate to get in contact with either me or any of my colleagues on the island if we can be of assistance. Um, you can find our contact details on our website, weareguernsey.com. Otherwise, uh, now back to you, Mike. Well, thank you very much indeed, Rupert. Um, a really comprehensive overview of, um, uh, of Guernsey's offering. Um, and focusing, of course, on the um, areas in which Guernsey has specialised for many years, not least the, um, its commitment to green finance um, more recently. Um, I just want to make a couple of comments about um, Guernsey as we see uh, the financial centre looking at it from outside. Um, when we started the Global Financial Centres Index, in, uh, first published in 2007, um, but it you know, generated from 2005 onwards. Um, we only had sort of 46 centres measured in the in the index, and what we've seen over the years is that um, 
you know, more and more centers have joined the index um, you know, with, with the onshore centers generally overtaking um, you know, island centers in terms of their ranking in the index. But um, that obscures the fact that uh, there is still room for specialization um, and island centers, offshore centers uh, generally um, have done well at finding a niche or finding various niches uh, where they offer uh, bespoke um, you know, services um, to to a very high standard. So there's a, a debate that we're still having about that question about uh, you know, how to measure general financial centres against specialist financial centres um, as as part of our research. And we survey um, financial professionals as part of our work. Uh, Guernsey has a particularly good reputation about those working in professional services and those working in finance, that is trade finance, commodity finance, um, who really appreciate what Guernsey has to offer. And I think the professional services across you know, law and accountancy and all those other um, places um, you know, rate Guernsey very highly. Um, and the quality of green finance that uh, Rupert mentioned is uh, shown in the Global Green Finance Index where Guernsey uh, ranks higher um, for quality of, of green finance um, than it does uh, actually in the, in the overall GFCI. Um, I'd just like to talk a bit about connectivity as well. Um, we look at um, who um, gives a rating uh, to whom in the uh, Global Financial Centres Index survey. Um, and the centres which have strongest links um, with Guernsey are Singapore, Dubai and London. Um, and that's not a bad mix actually. If you think about the you know, Asian markets through Singapore, Middle East markets through Dubai, um, and Western European markets through London. Um, although it do, does raise a question, I guess, or would raise a question for Rupert, you know, is um, you know, how to continue to grow connections with the Chinese market, um, and how to build connections with the North American market and maybe the you know, Caribbean market. Um, but that's how we, um, that we'd, we'd characterize uh, connectivity for Guernsey. Um, and that's all I've got to say, really, by the way, just um, a little snapshot of um, you know, how we see Guernsey from an external perspective. Um, so it is time to move on to questions and answers. Um, and partly, uh, I think you may have answered this, this question from Ian Hillier Brook, um, who asked specifically um, you know, during your presentation, you know, how many family offices are actually based on Guernsey and how far do you attribute that to um, you know, proximity to UK and that kind of regulatory system, your own regulatory actions. Um, you know, what is it that's driving uh, fa you know, family offices uh, to centre themselves in Guernsey? No, thank you. That's a that's a very good question. Um, I don't have to hand how many um, family offices that that we do have in Guernsey, but I know we certainly have have multiple here. Um, now, whether that is specific family offices for one family themselves or whether that is multi-family offices, we, we do tend to see that we have certain institutions over here who will have a number of very large families together for that kind of economy of scale, um, you know, for similar, um, you know, whether it's philanthropy or whether it's for green or whether it's for having some kind of um, similar investment outlook, um, they, they do like kind of pooling their resources together. Um, but certainly, I think there's a there's a number of reasons for for having it over here. Um, I think as I've, I've tried to highlight before, it's really the expertise of the financial services industry over here. Um, we have such good law firms over here, accountants over here, administrators over here, um, and they're all professionally trained. You know, we we do train our staff to an ex exceedingly high standard here. So um, you do have very professional service firms over here being able to um, service those very sophisticated family offices. The regulator also helps over here. The regulator in Guernsey is certainly very robust and I, I would never say anything more than that, but it's very flexible and it does listen to industry over here. So when we do have requirements and, and we do listen to um, you know the, the Guernsey Trust Association and, and, and other industries over here, um, and when they have a request and you know maybe there's something to help then enhance the family office uh, offering here within the island they're generally very responsive and, and if you look at the PIF um, that I previously described um, one of the reasons for actually changing the PIF regimes was to attract more family offices over here so um, I think you've got that that you know regulation um, I think one of the things that has been absolutely key recently is um, you know Guernsey being open for business we um, I'll probably come back to this a little later, but certainly how we've dealt with COVID over here 
has really demonstrated the island's resilience. It really has been very much the governance of, you know, not only looking at GFSC and, and, and how we've come through it, but it's how the island as a whole has done it. You look at how our government has done it. I think it probably did help to an extent that the chief medical officer over here, when we went into um, in, in, into this pandemic uh, at the beginning of last year, uh, was actually a trained virologist. So as such, we did have that uh, we, we did have that advantage, and um, she strategically had spreadsheets and, and, and various predictions. So we, we did come out of this well. So we have actually attracted a lot of family offices um, mm -hmm. on, on the back of that as well. Um, but yes, absolutely, communications, so being able to get to London easily, um, a, a digital communication as well. There, there's a number of different reasons um, for actually bringing family offices over here and, and, and locating them on Guernsey. Thank you very much. And maybe we can stick with the pandemic and its impact. Um, and you know, I, I said earlier, it wasn't intended to be flippant that you'd had a good pandemic. And what I meant was that you had remained open for business, which um, many countries have not been able to do. Um, and apart from you know, increased inquiries, I guess, from um, people who potentially want to base business um, in Guernsey, what do you think the effect has been? Um, and I'm thinking about the move to you know, online and digital as well as the, um, the, the impact of where business wants to place itself. Well, I, I think we have been very lucky. We, we had two short, sharp lockdowns, both lasting a couple of months each. But really, other than that, there's been no face masks, there's been no social distancing, shops are all open, restaurants are open, um, even nightclubs are open if you, that's your uh, your thing. Um, so yes, as such, it, it really has been a gentler lockdown over here. Um, and, you know, it really plays into the mantra of, of how we promote ourselves as Guernsey Finance, which is safety, security and stability. So, you know, not only we demonstrating that from a Guernsey financial services point of view. We're also, you know, really demonstrating it from an island point of view as well. So um, we had one of our first webinars when we first um, um, kind of uh, broached into that market, obviously not being able to, to physically travel as, as most people haven't been able to do. And we had a delegate from Switzerland. And, you know, you always think as the Swiss market of being the, the paradigm of, of, um, of, of, of uh, you know, bastion of safety and security. Um, and her exact quote was that Guernsey never missed a beat, which we thought was, you know, we've, we've uplifted that and we've, we've used it several times, you know, which has been um, very, very satisfying indeed. Um, but no, I mean, you know, um, we very much missed the travel. I, I will be honest with that. So when the pandemic first started, we are a promotional agency. So Guernsey Finances is, is all about promoting and connecting Guernsey and its uh, you know, financial services industry. So we had to switch very quickly from a, a physical onto a digital platform. Um, great compliments to the team here who, who basically did it seamlessly. Um, however, one great advantage that we saw straight away was obviously the international impact that that would give us. Our um, funds forum, which we held um, last year, we normally have seven different countries represented when we hold it physically in London. We had over 27 different countries represented. Um, we had double the amount of delegates uh, overseas. So it just shows how with digital, that global reach can, can really work. Um, so what we're seeing going forwards, and, and we have a couple of events coming up. We have our private wealth forum happening on the uh, uh, the 5th of, of, of October in London. We've also got a private wealth forum, which is happening towards the uh, end of November. We're really hoping at that stage to go out and, and get back in and, and get back into London again and, and physically engage. Um, I think the thing that, that we have missed is networking you know I, I think that is one of the things that, that we've really missed the webinars are, are good and they're all very well but it's that physical networking and that that one-to-one -one engagement that that we really have missed but um i'm sorry that's a very long way of answering your question yes we we have had a good lockdown here um 80 of the island is now fully vaccinated i.e as in uh, everybody over 18 has, has had the two jabs so we're one of the uh, highest in the world with that um, but yes, it will be good to get back into our, our markets again. And um, I, I, if, if you don't mind, Mike, I'll just quickly comment on that because you're mentioning our, our kind of connectivity and, and, and how we are, you know, kind of perceived by the rest of the world in, in our kind of global centres. Yeah. Um, very, very interesting that you mentioned Singapore, Dubai and London. We very much see our, our kind of core 
uh, markets as um, the UK. The UK will always be a core market for us. There's an excellent relationship between the two, and we really believe that we are a facilitator of capital flows um, between the UK, Europe, and, 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 and the US as well. Um, but looking at other markets, we've already got representatives in, in Hong Kong. So funny you said Singapore. Um, so we have somebody in, in Hong Kong. Um, so really, you know, facilitating growth into um, not only into China, but also into uh, other markets there. Um, so we're looking forward to the end of this year in 2022 to really be able to push that. Um, one that wasn't on your target was um, South Africa. Um, there's always been an excellent relationship between, um, I, I wouldn't say um, South Africa as well, but Southern Africa. So, you know, you're looking at other um, other Southern African uh, countries there. Uh, we have a representative down there who's, who's doing um, I, you know, a number of initiatives and really engaging with uh, with with industry down there, and and um, is 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 you know proving to be very valuable. Um, but definitely, um, Middle East is we, we're looking to appoint a representative in the Middle East this year, uh, and also the US as well. Um, mm. And um, sorry if I'm kind of stealing your thunder a bit here, but you, you mentioned getting access into um, you know some of the markets, uh, looking at the Caribbean and maybe looking at South America. Looking at that U.S. market, um, New York, absolutely, you know, private equity, private wealth to an extent. But we're very much seeing um, a lot of private wealth moving down to Florida now. And a lot of key industry is being driven from Florida. So we we, we need to have a look and, and think if, you know, where should our focus be? Should it just solely be on New York or should we be looking at, at Florida as well? And then using that as the catalyst to actually get into further markets down there. And and if you're looking at North America, I mean, you could well be also be looking at Seattle and be looking at uh, California. Um, you know that there's all that that, that America has those clusters of um, uh, of wealth, um, and it's where the companies um, that's managed that, that are managing those wealth cluster that you've really got to be looking at. Absolutely. Um, just moving on, and uh, we, we've talked a bit about family offices, but I mean, I guess the question is if um, you're providing services to you know high net worth and ultra high net worth individuals. Um, you know, how does that fit, I guess, with your commitment to sustainability? You know, is part of your role, you think, in actually uh, funneling people or helping people to funnel their wealth into good causes or sustainability? And how do you do that? I mean, we've we've engaged a lot with with industry over here, and one of the things we're seeing and is quite fundamental is the the, the change of, of wealth ownership from an older generation into a younger generation. And it really is this younger generation that is we're seeing as the catalyst are looking a lot more at ESG. They're looking at green, they're looking at sustainability. They're looking at, you know, how fragile our planet really is. And they've, you know, the, the older generation has amassed this wealth. So can the younger generation take a portion of that wealth and then siphon it off into good causes whether that be philanthropy whether that be into you know really um you know charitable uh, escapades you know whatever um the family really chooses as 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 importance but there's also i mean i guess there's there's two sides to that isn't there, there there's the pure philanthropy side where you're giving your money away and you're giving it over, over to a charity or you know whatever it is but there's also you may have some people who are looking to make that money work as well so you know not only am, am i looking to champion um, charitable or, or impact investing, but I need some kind of return on that as well. So um, that's really where, you know, Guernsey has come in. So looking at, at you know, green funds over here, looking at how ties has uh, its sustainable part of the stock exchange. So some of those family offices like those green credentials of Guernsey. They like how we're pushing ahead. They like how, you know, we have that insurance kite mark now as well. Um, and that, you know, we are a true innovator in the space. And, you know, the GFSC has recently tightened uh, the regulation here just to really show the rest of the world that it's not greenwashing. And I, I think that is, in certain jurisdictions, you're seeing that happening. You know, they, they say they have a, a, a credentials or they have a badge, but, you know, have they really? Um, so, yes, we, we, do really see ourselves as 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 an enabler. Um, what we're really trying to promote ourselves is is you know a force a, a force for global good in that international market. Um, and again, having things like 
um, charitable trusts, charitable cha foundations, having all these kind of vehicles in our armory really help those family offices as well um, because they don't need to seek a different jurisdiction to to actually be able to use those vehicles in which to then invest through into those uh, investment managers or, or, or good causes they're looking really to support. Thanks very much. And um, you know, the Guernsey Green Fund, I know a little bit about. If you want to know more about uh, the Green Fund and how it's worked, I'm sure there's material on your website, Rupert, uh, and links through, links through to Guernsey Green Finance. Um, and so please go and take a, a look at those. I've got a question from Hadley Chilton, who's asking, where do you see yourself and Guernsey see itself in terms of uh, DEFI and digital assets um, and the regulation of those kind of spaces? It's something that's being mooted at the highest level at the moment. Um, Guernsey Finance is, is part owned by the states of Guernsey and we're, we're part owned by industry as well. So we sit on a number of different committees and associations, some of those being governmental and some of those uh, being industry. Um, it's, it is a, a key area that we are looking to develop at the moment. I'll be honest in that we haven't been an innovator in the area. We've been watching very closely different jurisdictions and how they dealt with it, some better than others, obviously, as I think we, we probably know. Um, but it's something that we don't want to get left behind. However, we don't really want to be at the forefront either. So um, I think if you watch this space in the next 12 to 24 months, you will see that Guernsey will be developing that kind of offering. Um, but certainly, as it stands at the moment, the talks are at the highest levels and, and we're kind of developing, um, you know, um, how we're going to take that forward. Uh, so definitely watch this space on the um, digital finance space. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to ask a bit about um, you know, Guernsey's openness, I guess, to immigration. Um, we mentioned ultra high you know, net worth individuals and high net worth individuals. Um, and sometimes those people are looking for not only where to domicile their money and their uh, family office, but also about um, living opportunities. Um, and we just have a question to say, you know, how easy it is it to um, find, find your place in Guernsey? Um, remarkably easy, actually. Um, we, we don't have a complicated tiering system or licensing system or um, that, you know, um, some other jurisdictions do. Um, we have um, two sides to the housing market here. Um, we have the local market and we have the open market. The local market, as it would sound, is for those who are locally qualified or, or um, do come on a particular license. But then you have the open market and the open market is, as it sounds, um, is open to anybody. So if, uh, and we've seen this very recently, we've had a large number of high net worth families coming over to Guernsey, seeing how well we've done during COVID, seeing the infrastructure, seeing how beautiful the island is, um, you know, transport links, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not just one thing, obviously, yeah. a family's looking at, um, but we have a very high quality housing market here as well. So if they find a house on the open market that they like and they purchase that, that basically gives them open residency in Guernsey um, and that is for them and their immediate family as well. So we, mm. we've actually seen a number of generations coming over to Guernsey um, and that's it, it's, it's great for us because obviously it's a great um, advertisement for the island. It's great inward investment into the island as well. Um, but it also means that, you know, we're, we're actually doing what we're saying. And some of that has also been absolutely on the green and the ESG side as well. People have been very much attracted to that. They've come over and, and they've seen that, you know, as an island as well, we're also very much um, looking at our green credential, not just from financial services, but we're looking at it across the board as well. Um, all our electricity in, in Guernsey um, comes from uh, sustainable sources. So, you know, there, there's other there's other criteria there. There's, there's other things the island are doing just to really, you know, get that, that ESG badge without doubt. We, we, we tend to find looking at green finance through the Global Green Finance Index that it is cities, places that take actually sustainability seriously across the board um, that are you know, performing best in terms of the Green Finance Index. So I'm, I'm not surprised that that's mm. uh, part of the background to, to, to the way that Guernsey runs itself. Um, we are sadly running out of time, Rupert. I'm sure there could be uh, many more questions. And, and I'm sure, as you, you mentioned, your contact details are on the wearegernsey.com uh, website. So there's the opportunity for people to uh, follow up with you after after the event. Um, but I really ought to bring the uh, session to a close as we run out of time. Um, so a few rounds of thank yous. First of all, again, thank you uh, to the FS Club sponsors um, who 
uh, support us in running uh, the events that we run um, and you know, ranging widely across the world in this case, as well as across uh, topic. Um, secondly, to thank you, the audience, um, for your uh, attendance today. Um, just to say we have some very interesting uh, events coming up. Um, uh, tomorrow, cryptocurrency, the parallel financial world. If you don't know about cryptocurrency and really want to get to know about it, um, here's your opportunity. Uh, privacy enhancing technologies um, on Friday and uh, then CCPs um, on, on Monday. So please do take a look at the website, um, get involved, uh, come along to the uh, webinars that um, take your fancy. Um, my final thank you is, for, is to Rupert um, to say thank you. Uh, for your time, uh, for your excellent presentation, and your willingness to engage uh, in the questions uh, and answers. Uh, as I said, we'll pass on uh, contact details of those who ask questions to you. Um, but it really has been a pleasure to um, welcome you to uh, the world of um, our webinars this afternoon. So thank you very much. I would normally, at this point, throw open the floor uh, for a well-deserved round of applause. Um, I'm afraid <laughs> we can't quite manage that yet over the uh, the webinar platform, so you'll have to make do with a very small round of applause. Thank you very much indeed. No, it's been an absolute pleasure, Mike. And, and as you say, if anybody would like to get in contact after the webinar, please do. That would be great. Well, thank you very much um, and good afternoon. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.